Thank you very much. Uh, let me welcome members to the fourth meeting in 2016 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. And as usual, remind everybody to switch off mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. Um, we've received apologies from Cameron Buchanan, and once again, we have John Scott uh, with us uh, to substitute. Uh, there is only one item uh, on today's agenda, and that's to consider a note by the clerk uh, regarding Chapter 9B of Standing Orders, consent in relation to UK Parliament bills. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we can discuss that uh, uh, fairly well-focused and... Uh, and, and in short order. Uh, just now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as, uh, as convener. I don't usually do this. I've been wrestling with, uh, uh, with what uh, Mary has, has brought to us, which I think is entirely proper, uh, proper thing. And I, I've come to some personal conclusions, which my political colleagues and uh, committee colleagues may or may not agree with, uh, but I'll just put them out there to, to, to see if they, they, they help at all. In a sense, I've, I've come to the conclusion that what Mary is trying to do is perhaps more restricted than too, uh, too narrow, because there's a, perhaps underlying a broader issue uh, that, that Mary's uh, proposal quite properly uh, uh, addresses, that in essence, from time to time, this Parliament will wish to uh, inform in a formal sense another Parliament, generally Westminster, uh, of a view that it, we might take on a subject uh, which may or may not be within our legislative competence. Um, I, I, ju I just use an example, not, not for any particular reason around the politics. We might wish, feeling strongly about the matter, uh, to make a, a comment to Westminster about this Parliament's view on a matter that relates to defence, which is clearly and absolutely outside our legislative competence. And, and perhaps uh, what Mary has done is given us the opportunity to think uh, about the processes by which we might uh, do such thing. I think uh, the paper uh, makes reference to the Welsh Assembly's recent uh, activities in LCM. Uh, and, and indeed, that illustrates that what I'm saying and what we're wrestling with isn't necessarily just a matter of the Scottish Parliament. It, certainly is for Wales, it may be for Northern Ireland, indeed it even could be uh, for the jurisdictions of Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. And I happen to know, uh, because of a meeting I had, that uh, Guernsey are wrestling with difficulties uh, in the way in which uh, their views are dealt with. Uh, so I, I'm coming from a sort of starting position, and I think uh, Mary's brought something forward, but I don't think that I would be willing to uh, support it in its present form. But I think that, that uh, you know, Mary could be uh, asked, uh, and this would be entirely for her to consider, uh, whether to work with the clerk and uh, others on the committee to bring something uh, forward that's actually stronger and is a standalone provision um, that, that, that uh, the committee's uh, successor in Parliament might consider. And in the meantime, uh, we per could consider asking the presiding officer uh, to meet with or correspond with uh, opposite numbers in other jurisdictions so that we actually have a parliament-to-parliament -parliament protocol, which is quite a different thing from what we have. Uh, that means there is a formal way in which the parliaments can inform other jurisdictions of their views on uh, important matters of the day that may or may not be within competence. Anyway, that's merely... My, my thinking, my thinking is not set in stone. I have not, I'm not taking a position um, on that. It's just in trying to think of wh where, we, where we are, that, that, that was the thinking I have. Now, that's me having exercised my prerogative. I now resume that um, position of absolute impartiality in relation to the discussion we're about to have and invite uh, other members uh, to, to, to contribute to and address um, what the clerks have put in. Uh, their paper. Do you want to start, Mary? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, convener. I'm grateful to the committee for taking the time to, to look at this issue, um, which, of course, committee will know that the issue arose with the passing of the Westminster Trade Union Bill and um, our ability or inability to comment or fully Im implement that. Um, and, and my letter was proposing a change to standing order Rule 9B12, um, which would allow us to lay a legislative consent motion um, to treat the Trade Union Bill as a relevant bill or not. 
Um, and obviously, the convener mentioned the Welsh, Welsh Assembly. Uh, the Welsh Assembly has considered an, L an LCM in relation to the Trade Union Bill, and the Assembly has not agreed to consent. We, of course, don't have that opportunity, and we would require to change the rules um, to allow us to do that. And I'm grateful to the clerks for preparing the paper, which I think has been really helpful in explaining the issues within the Sewell Convention and the, the memorandum. Um, and I'm also... Um, I'm grateful for Stuart's word. However, I would be concerned by opening this up too much. I think we need to keep quite a narrow focus on what we're doing and look to changing our standing orders in, in, in 9B and doing that alone and not opening it up too much. Um, I would be content for it to be looked at um, in next session to be part of the legacy paper, but I think we need to be quite constrained in, in, in how we do that. But I would be interested to hear the views of other committee members. Anyone wish to catch my eye? Mr Russell? Yeah. Um, I think everybody agrees that something should be done. As ever, the problem is what should be done. Um, and I think it's uh, the right thing to do for this to be considered uh, it, as a, via the legacy paper by the next committee. I am uh, instinctively attracted to what you say, convener, because I think you have identified an issue which, despite the fact that we have discussed this on two previous occasions, hasn't yet been identified, which is your particular um, uh, genius, I would say, if I may use that word. I don't want to be quoted on that, however. Um, a, I think that the issue is parliament to parliament uh, and not government to government. As I said last week, and I'm happy to repeat here because uh, Mary wasn't here last week, uh, the issue is not the obnoxious nature of the, the trade union bill, which is thoroughly obnoxious and is opposed certainly by the vast majority of people sitting around this table. We don't want that to happen. It, it is also not the individual ruling of the presiding officer whether or not you agree with that. And, you know, presiding officers are, are not infallible and there could well be, be room for debate upon this. The issue is how we resolve this for the future. And I think the issue of uh, the parliament being able to express its opinion about a piece of uh, proposed legislation or legislation from elsewhere which d is not subject to a legislative <coughs> consent motion and won't be, um, is attractive. Uh, and I think it gives us a, 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 an opportunity to do something if properly <coughs> formalised. For example, it might require the clerk to uh, communicate that to the clerk of the other parliament. It wouldn't necessarily apply only to Westminster. The clerk to the other parliament, uh, it might request that that be laid or uh, in that other parliament whether or not that happens doesn't really matter. There is an issue which is no matter what we do, we are not sovereign, so we can't refuse something because we don't have that final power. But to formalize, formalize things in a way that gives us the maximum opportunity of saying what we want to say in the most effective way is what we should do. And I don't think that we should rush into changing standing orders on the basis of a single ruling. But what Mary Fee has identified here is a weakness in the present structure that needs change. And I think, therefore, I'm attracted to what you say. I'm not attracted to the idea of a narrow solution based on the single instance, but I'm attracted to a new opportunity that the Parliament would get if uh, your proposal were to go forward. So whatever happens, this has to go into our legacy paper. It's a question of how it goes in. And uh, my, my, my sympathy would be to put it in in the way of saying this creates a, a desire and a need for a change to the standing orders. That's accepted. What change that should be is the question. And the committee will need to inquire into that but I am certainly attracted to what you're saying. Uh, before I open it up, can I just say uh, we will, I expect we will be dealing with the issue of the content of our legacy paper at our next meeting. So we may not need to open up today too widely the issue of what might be said in that legacy paper, although it would be helpful to the clerks for them to get a sense of what we might uh, broadly wish to be there. The detail will come to uh, if uh, the convener and deputy convener agree with the clerks uh, what's to come to our next meeting. John. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, yes, I would agree with probably almost all of what has been said. Uh, in terms of adding something to it, I would just point out that there is a great deal going on at the moment in terms of interaction between the parliaments and legislation and there's a, a certainly a measure of uncertainty as to how that is all going to pan out. Um, similarly, like others, I would not wish to uh, seek a change to our standing orders on the basis of one piece of legislation, however uh, much it is the expressed view of our parliament that we don't like it. Um, 
However, that said, I'm, I think what you said was a, a pretty reasonable idea. I'm not averse to a parliament-to-parliament -parliament communication um, and some kind of protocol being established for that to express uh, views between or to allow views of one parliament to be made known to another. Uh, what would interest me particularly uh, is um, what standing such a communication would have um, on receipt of uh, uh, such a view being made known. Um, would it have would it, how would it be dealt with, or would it just be take note? Uh, and that, that, uh, but uh, that is perhaps, in my view, a matter for the future. Um, for uh, and so I'm, I'm very much of the view that this is, if, it, if it's going to be looked at, and and, and if if we are of the view that it should be looked at, then I think it has to be looked at properly and in depth and reasonably and cautiously and in a considered way um, and, and all experience tells me that we should not act um, in haste and repent at leisure in terms of changing standing orders or indeed making legislation. So I think that the, the place for this is in a legacy document um, and, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you. David. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, obviously we, we are where we are and uh, we know exactly what the situation is in relation to the trade union bill. It's, it's gone through. It's, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. That's a fact. Uh, that's very unfortunate because I'm very much opposed to it personally, as I also said last week, Mary, uh, at, at, at the meeting. And I, I think that the other devolved administrations in Wales and Northern Ireland, you know, um, will be interested, I would think, in the suggestion that you've made, Convener. Uh, and if we can get agreement with them, then that will be a very powerful thing in relation to any discussions that we have with the UK Parliament. Uh, because it's always been said that, that devolution is a process uh, and so on, uh, be that as it may. Uh, this is something that's been highlighted by Mary Fee because of the trade union bill and highlighted our impotence in relation to it. So it would be good if we could move things forward and get a parliament-to-parliament -parliament agreement uh, amongst all of the four parliaments in the UK and maybe even other uh, jurisdictions too, like so, I think you mentioned Guernsey and so on, and Isle of Man and Jersey. Um, where this would help to move, put things on a proper footing and help things uh, move forward. And I think we, when we discuss our legacy paper, we need to go into a little bit more detail as to what our ideas are so that the committee that follows us um, very clearly understands what we are asking them to do. Uh, I, I see, John. I just want to make sure the other two members who have not yet spoken are not catching my eye yet. John, I'll go back to you then. Thank you. I mean, were such a process to be put in place, um, it, 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 for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, doubtless you will be as au fait with Newton's uh, second law as I am a uh, convener. But um, th if there is to be a process whereby we as uh, a parliament or other devolved parliaments have a way of making our um, views known to um, the Westminster Parliament, it would only be reasonable um, if that process was a two-way street. And therefore, how much would we welcome uh, Westminster Parliament making their views known to us about legislation over which we um, have uh, authority? And, and that's why it's important to know quite what um, status such a communication uh, would have. Sure. If I could just answer John's point first. I don't think it is actually the case that there would have to be a reaction, as it was put. Um, the, the fact of the matter is Westminster can legislate for us. We can't legislate for Westminster. Mm -hmm. So it is a one-way street in that sense. Um, I don't have a problem with what the convener is suggesting. Will it make any difference? Probably not. Uh, it's just more of the same. However, it doesn't resolve the problem that Mary's letter mm -hmm. sought to resolve. And it's actually 
in a sense, um, unconnected to that particular problem. Um, it, it may be arising as a result of that particular letter, <coughs> but it doesn't do anything, worthy though it may be, to resolve the problem that we had in front of us regarding the trade union bill. And um, that was my concern, that we needed to do something in regard to that bill. So, uh, Right, colleagues, I think, I think we've given it a reasonable square go, and I think we probably, informally, I can see uh, what our positions are. Um, I, I propose, therefore, at this stage, if unless anyone objects, uh, that I formally put before you, it's Mary's initiative that we uh, propose a change to the standing orders and uh, perhaps formally invite members to indicate those who wish to support Mary's proposal for, for that and those who, who wish uh, not to do so. And then we can come back to... Uh, well, that is what Mary is asking for, I guess. Uh, no, because you know, I, I couldn't support an immediate change to the standing orders, but I could support change to the standing orders after due consideration. Well, Mary, Mary has put a very specific yes. form of words in front of us, so we're quite clear what it is yeah. we're taking a decision on. And I think we've got to the point where we as a committee yeah. should simply take a view on the matter. Um, and, uh, and, and given that that's the case, uh, can I invite those who wish to support uh, progressing an immediate uh, change of the standing orders to so indicate, um, which, as expected, is two, and those who do not wish an immediate change of standing orders is five. Now, thank you. I, I think that takes us forward, uh, not unanimously, which is, you know, is always my, my strong preference, uh, but I, th I, th I think that, that does that. Now, the, the, the issue we've been discussing um, in the run-up to our taking that decision. Uh, yes, of course, well, if you're sure it's a point of order, rather than merely an observation. Uh, uh, the, the, the recording of decisions of this committee presumably will record that the vote is on an, the immediate change in the standing orders, not on the merits or otherwise of the legislation, which has been opposed by the vast majority of those present and continues to be opposed by them, just in case there were any chance of misrepresentation of this issue. Um, I'm not sure it's a point of order, but we are in public session, and your remarks will, of course, appear uh, in the official report, and I see no one dissenting from them. So I think that will represent, uh, as far as I can establish, uh, the, the views of the committee. Um, I, th I think I take the sense of the committee, too, uh, that uh, we are minded to think further of standing order changes. I suggested in my opening remarks that Mary Fee might continue to take the lead on this if she wished to do so. I'm getting a nod suggesting you would be yeah. willing to do that. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think it, it, it's definitely an issue that needs further consideration. Um, I, I think the convener's suggestion where we, we, we find a, a mechanism where Parliament, parliaments um, communicate with each other their, their views wouldn't automatically lead to a change in our standing orders that would give us the ability to consent to or not to consent to a change to standing orders would, which is why I'm concerned about the, um, the suggestion that the convener has made. However, I think it's, it's, it's something that we need to continue to look at, and it may, may well be by doing some form of inquiry into what is the best way of taking this forward that it may ultimately lead to we need to change our standing orders. David. Yeah, convener. Um, yeah, I mean, changing standing orders on the face of it seems to be very simple and straightforward, and it, it'll, you know, it, it, some would argue it may deal with the problem. Uh, I'm not sure it would. I think we need more than that. I, ne I think that we need the standing orders to be looked at and also the interparliamentary situation to be looked at. Because you only have to look at what happened in Wales. They voted on an LCM, voted against the trade union bill, uh, according to the, the report here. Uh, we believe that the UK government just said, well, sorry, you know, it doesn't apply. So basically... Even changing the standing orders now to allow us to debate an LCM would have achieved the same result. We would have given our view that we're against the trade union bill, which we've given anyway, to be told by the UK government, sorry, it's a reserved matter, so it doesn't apply. So we do need to look at this in a very careful way. And I think we need to involve people from out with the parliamentary process and, and 
Civic Scotland and more widely with the other devolved administrations. It needs quite a bit of work, I think, to work through just how we get a sensible relationship in relation to these matters with the other devolved administrations, with the UK government. So I don't think it's something that you can do quickly. You have to think it through. You've got to work out all the angles because if you rush into these things, there could be unintended consequences that you haven't thought about. So you, you need to be very careful when you're dealing with these matters. Uh, let me just remind committee, I think we've got to a position where we're beginning to talk about what will be in our legacy paper, and we expect, I think, to discuss that at our next meeting. Um, and I, I think that's the proper place to continue that particular discussion. Uh, on that basis, uh, colleagues, uh, I close the public part of this meeting.